Now I'm going to show you how to use separation of variables to solve a physics problem. The problem involves a long plate which conducts heat. So the plate will say is 10 centimeters wide and we'll just say it's much longer than wide so we don't have to worry about exactly how long we'll treat it as infinitely long. And now we need to say what we're doing with the plate. So we're going to hold this end down here at 100 degrees, and the other three ends we're going to hold at 0 degrees. And the question is, what is the distribution of temperature in the plate? The equation that we need to solve to answer it is the heat equation, which in steady state reduces to the Laplace equation, which we studied in the last video. What we have now is what's called a boundary value problem. We're asked to solve this equation subject to conditions on boundaries of our domain. So when faced with a boundary value problem, the first thing you should do is make the problem into math. Instead of drawing pictures, or in addition to drawing pictures, let's list the conditions. So our final solution to this equation needs to satisfy four things, one on each boundary. On this left boundary here, let's call that x equals zero. At any y, the temperature has to vanish. So I put the origin of my axes here, I've called this the x-axis, and I've called this the y-axis. That's condition one for the left boundary. Uh, let's do the right boundary next. That says that T of X equals 10 and Y equals zero. I'm not gonna worry about units, I'm just gonna use the number 10. So that says that the temperature is zero there. And then the far away boundary, well that says the temperature at any X but y getting very large must be zero. And then finally, I'm holding the temperature at 100 down here on the x-axis, so t of x, y equals zero, must be 100. Now there's a theory of the Laplace equation that we're not going to cover, but it tells you that there will be a unique solution to this problem because you've given the value on all four boundaries. It's called a Dirichlet problem if you want to look it up. And our task now is to find that solution using separation of variables. So recall that in the last video we had found a whole bunch of solutions taking the form of a product, x of x times y of y, which we wrote as a sine kx plus b cosine kx times c e to the ky plus d e to the minus ky. Okay, so for any numbers a, b, c, d, and k, this solution solves a little plus equation. Now there's one thing I should be careful about, which I didn't mention in the last video, which is the special case when k equals zero. Actually, when k equals zero, uh, this is not a good solution at all, because it's just zero plus zero, and these solutions become linearly dependent, they're both constant, so one has to treat the k equals zero space separately. To keep things simple and focus on the method, I'm just going to not worry about k equals zero, and we will get the solution without allowing k equals zero. So just for simplicity, I'm going to take k not equals zero from the start. All right, this is a bunch of solutions, but there's no guarantee that the solution we are interested in that satisfies these four conditions will actually be among them, but we can start trying. Let's be optimistic, let's try. So let's impose these four conditions and see what happens. So here's condition one. Condition one says that t of x equals zero and y it's supposed to equal zero, so zero equals t, x equals zero and y, and we just plug in up here, 
Well, at x equals 0, sine 0 is 0, so that term is just 0. Cosine 0 is 1, so that term is just b. And then there's really nothing we can do with this. This condition has to hold at every y, so we just copy it down. All right, so this thing here has to equal 0 according to condition 1. We could do that with b equals 0, but that would be a little trivial and uninteresting. So, excuse me, that's what we want. We could do it with c equals d equals 0, but that would be a little trivial and uninteresting because that would make the whole solution t vanish. But if we do it with b equals 0, we still have this term left, so that's pretty interesting. So c equals d equals 0 is not what we want. Not interesting, because it sets t equals 0 everywhere. But if we do b equals 0, our full solution t won't be 0 everywhere. It'll just be 0 where we want it to be on this left boundary. So what we take is b equals 0. That's our conclusion from condition 1. OK. So we're narrowing down our solution up here. Let's move on to condition two. That says zero equals t of x equals 10, comma y. What's that? A sine 10k, plugging in x equals 10. And there's again nothing we can do with the y dependence, c e to the ky plus d e to the minus ky. And now we need this to vanish. Now the simplest thing, we've already decided c equals d equals 0 is not interesting. We don't want to consider a equals 0 either, because again, we've already taken z, b 0, so if a is 0 too, we have the same problem. And so if a equals b equals 0 means t of x, y equals 0, we don't want that. So we pick instead that sine 10k has to equal 0. Okay, so what does that mean about k? Well, k equals 0 would do it because sine 0 is 0. But remember, sine is an oscillating function. It goes through 0 many, many times, infinitely many times. So there's going to be infinite values of k that make this 0. And what are they? Well, k equals 0 is 1. But another one is sine goes through 0 at pi, right? Sine pi is 0. So if we have 10k equals pi, that'll also work. But it'll also work if 10k equals 2 pi, because sine, sine 2 pi is 0, and so on. In fact, 10k equals n pi for any integer n will do it. So. The solution, what we actually learn here, is that k equals n pi over 10. Where n is an integer. On to condition 3. So instead of k not equal 0, I, I mean, in addition to k not equal 0 up here, I can add that we now know k is n pi over 10, where n is an integer. OK, let's keep going. Condition 3 says we're supposed to evaluate t at any x, but at large y. So what is that? Well, I've already got b equals 0. Uh, I've got, so I'll still keep a sine kx. Nothing I can do with the x dependence in this condition. And now the y dependence is e to the k times infinity, if you like, plus, I forgot the constant c, plus d e to the minus k times infinity. Now, here we need to consider two separate cases, k positive and k negative, because these terms behave very differently when k is positive versus when k is negative. On the other hand, 
If we just send k to minus k in this expression, well, sine is an odd function, so that just flips the sine, which is the same as redefining capital A, little a. And over here, it, if we just send k to minus k, it's the same as interchanging c and d. So merely by redefining a, c, and d, I can change the sine of k. So there's no loss of generality in just assuming k greater than zero. We sometimes write w log without loss of generality. We are allowed to do that. So we take k greater than zero. We've already excluded k equals zero. And now, assuming k is greater than zero, this term is huge. And this term is zero, right? E to some very big number is a big number. E to some minus some very big number is a very small number. So in order to make it zero, this term is okay, but this term is not. This is blowing up. It violates our boundary condition. Therefore, we can't have this term, and we get C equals zero. Okay, let's keep going. Condition four, and I should update this to say k greater than zero, because that's our assumption without loss of generality. All right, now we just hope we can impose condition four. But you can see right away there's gonna be a problem. Condition four says that 100 ought to equal t, of x and y equals zero. We plug in up here, that's a sine kx d p to the minus ky. And this is supposed to equal, uh, excuse me, e to the minus zero, so that's just one. So it's just a d sine kx. And sine kx here is supposed to equal 100 for all x. That's what our condition tells us. Now, k equals 0 won't work, and we've already excluded it anyway, but k equals 0 just gives us 0. And any non-zero value of k, well, the sine is a wiggly function, and this is a constant. So there's nothing we can do. We cannot satisfy all four conditions with a product solution. Does that mean we give up? No. Here's the beauty of separation of variables. Even though we can't use one of these solutions to satisfy all four of our boundary conditions, because this equation is linear, we can superpose two solutions and get a third. Take any two solutions of this equation, add them together, the sum will satisfy the equation because the derivative is a linear operation. So we're going to use superposition, and we're going to try not just one solution, in fact, not just two or three or four, but an infinite number, an infinite sum of product solutions, and we're going to use that to satisfy the final boundary condition. So for four, we actually need a sum. T has to be a sum from n all the different values of n, remember k is n pi over 10, so we can only take discrete values, and k must be positive, so it starts at one and goes to infinity, and then we have our product solution, a sine kx, let's write kx as n pi x over 10, and then d e to the minus ky, and let's write k again as n pi y over 10. And we need to be able to choose different constants a and d for each value of n. Now there's no point in calling a, the constant a times d, let's just call it c sub n. Okay, so for our fourth condition, instead of trying a single one, we sum an infinite number of product solutions, each with a different integer value of n and a different coefficient in front of it. 
So now let's see if we can satisfy condition four. It says that 100 is equal to t of x and y equals zero. So that's the sum from n equals one to infinity of c sub n sine n pi x over 10, and then e to the minus n pi y over 10. Well, we go up to y equals zero for condition four, so that's just one. So here's what we need to do. We need to find the number c sub n such that this equation is true. And you should recognize this as a Fourier series. It's a series involving sines and cosines, actually just the sine function, but nevertheless, a Fourier series. So what we need to do is find the numbers c sub n such that this Fourier series equals 100. Now there's two ways to do this. One way is to just Google around, look in the book, search around for a Fourier series, and see if you can find like a series for a constant function involving sines and cosines, or maybe a series for a square wave, but you just look at it at the part where the function is constant. You just sort of look up the c sub n and guess the answer. And that's perfectly valid for doing homework assignments in this class. But if you want to do it directly, here's the way to think about it. The first thing to notice is that this says n pi x over 10. So it fits the form of a Fourier series for a function defined on minus 10 to 10. I call the parameter little l equal, uh, parameter little l in the video titled Fourier transform where I went over doing Fourier series involving values of l that are not equal to pi. So the domain you need to be thinking about for this function is actually from minus 10 to 10, which is a little funny because our plate here only goes from 0 to 10. This region over here to the left isn't part of the physical domain, but it's going to be part of the mathematics because of what popped out of our separation of variables solution. So the first thing we need to do is think about our function t of x comma zero, that's what we're looking at here, not on the domain zero to 10, but also on the domain minus 10 to zero. And what are we supposed to do with this there? Well, notice the sine function is odd. So if we're gonna get a series involving odd functions on the right, we want an odd function on the left. So it's telling us that we need to extend our function, which takes the value plus 100 on the right-hand side, by just making up a new function that takes the value minus 100 on the left-hand side, so it's an odd function, and its Fourier series will involve signs. Okay? So we've translated the problem into find the real form of the Fourier series of this step function, which goes from minus 100 on the left part to plus 100 on the right part, and that's a problem you can do with the same techniques I've taught, and when you go and do the calculation, you will find, after first doing the complex form, and then finally writing everything in the manifestly real form with sines and cosines, you will find that c sub n is equal to 400 over n pi, of course, assuming n is odd, which are the only things that appear. Uh, no, 400 over n pi, n odd, and if it's even, you will find zero. Okay, so I didn't do that calculation in front of you, but it's the same thing I did in the second video on this series, just with a different function and a different range from minus 10 to 10. All right, so we found c sub n. And if we go back to our ansatz here at Step four, c sub n was the only thing we didn't know. So we've actually solved the problem entirely. The solution to our boundary value problem is capital T is equal to the sum over n equals only the odd ones all the way to infinity of the c sub n, which is 400 over n pi sine n pi x over 10, 
e to the minus n pi y over 10. It's not a simple solution. It's a sum of a bunch of functions, but it's a solution. We've written it down in closed form. This Fourier series will converge. If you want to actually find out the temperature distribution at any point, say that one in your plate, you just plug in the x value of that point, plug in the y value of that point, and ask the computer to include the first 10 terms, the first 100 terms, whatever you want to get an answer as accurate as you want. And that's how you use separation of variables to solve a simple boundary value problem.